So this is series two, episode one, and I'm talking to Ben Zimmer and Eric Chaikin of Beyond Wordplay. And I think the best place to start, the obvious place to start, is to ask you what Beyond Wordplay is and how it came into existence. You want me to take that, Ben, since I, I go for it, Eric. Somewhat, yeah, you've, you've got, I, well, I did got pull the origin the, story. <laughs> I did pull Ben into the effort, although I'm only the middle link in the chain. So I, I usually start by saying that Beyond Wordplay is an anarcho syndicalist uh, commune, you know, because it's a volunteer effort of wordplay lovers uh, whose mission is to present be a, a central destination for the art, science, and culture of serious wordplay. Um, and the kind of principles of it are uh, Ben and myself and a fellow named Chris Cole. Uh, we all happen to be in the National Puzzlers League um, and, and have background in that, but we are also just uh, come from different backgrounds of loving words. But um, the, the origin of it, uh, insofar as, you know, my, kind of my, my path with it was Chris Cole is a kind of an old school technologist with a love for wordplay. And he's he had a project called the Borgman Project, and we'll get into Dimitri Borgman, um, which was a, a sort of a a very comprehensive technical approach to attempt to answer the question, what is a word? <laughs> or what are all the words, uh, what can be considered all the words in the English language, which is a very loaded question. Um, and he had presented a talk to Google, and out of that came sort of a very completist approach to um, analyzing strings found on the web and trying to determine which of them were words. I kind of merged in with him on that um, on a group that was having weekly discussions and we started talking about broadening the concept of wordplay from dictionary based wordplay to involve more pop culture. And that was really, you know, kind of the direction things were going. And Ben and I kind of bonded in various uh, efforts out there in the, you know, in the, in the web that that really tied together our love for pop culture and wordplay, um, which sort of has a history in Wordways, the Journal of Recreation Linguistics, Games Magazine, the books of Dimitri Borgman. And Ben is a, I would say, as close to a uh, uh, our, our local celebrity as, as you can have. He's got a, he's got a very well-known and well-regarded presence in the wordplay community and really bridges the gap between the kind of serious core uh, wordplay, you know, logo files and uh, sort of, you know, the broader reach of more, more general audience people who still love words. And so I would say that that chain of Chris and me and Ben has formed the, the, uh, the nucleus of Beyond Wordplay. And we have a team of other people that are wonderful wordplay lovers and contribute things. So we've got a blog and a Twitter feed and we occasionally do events where we, uh, you know, create puzzles or otherwise have a, a presence. And we have and grants. a newsletter, of course. Don't yes, forget about the newsletter edited by Allegra Cooney, which uh, uh, one came out not too long ago. But uh, that's that's been another way to sort of uh, get the word out to uh, the wordplay community, where we can talk about things that we've been uh, posting in terms of our own content on BeyondWordplay.com, and just kind of you know yeah point to uh, events and other things that are going on in the wordplay world and you know we're just trying to be kind of a, a hub for all of that discussion so uh, what's well, so one of the inspirations was the national yeah. puzzlers league which i miss i don't know too much about being from a different oh, nation, I guess. we're gonna rope you in before <laughs> the end of this podcast you're gonna have a nom and everything i promise uh, i'm sure it's gonna be therein you know something of in with you know mixing up the letters and therein I, I would say that NPL is National Puzzlers League, or which is, uh, I believe, puzzlers.org is the, the website, um, people go to it, is kind of a, it's a longstanding core community of, you know, of serious wordplay lovers and, and, and constructors. Most of the well-known constructors of puzzles you'll see, uh, you know, certainly in the US, but there are some UK members as well, um, are NPL members. But our goal with Beyond Wordplay was to broaden the broaden the appeal, to do things that were much more web friendly, pop culture friendly, really combine kind of a pub quiz sensibility with our love for wordplay. Um, so NPL was a starting point and we can get into some of the fun things that go on inside that, but it's really a branching off point more than anything. One thing I find interesting just, you know, as a longstanding member of the NPL and learning about its history, is that it was founded at a time when when wordplay of a particular kind, usually uh, word puzzles in verse, 
were actually quite popular. And I'm talking about in the 19th century, the late 19th century, you could, uh, you know, before the crossword craze started in the early 20th century, if you opened up a, a newspaper to, you know, uh, a page that might have various sort of recreational things on it, um, you would quite likely find this kind of uh, word puzzle in verse, what the NPL calls a flat. And, um, you know, there were anagrams and palindromes and charades and various other wordplay forms kind of um, uh, got to be popular in, in a, you know, fairly broad audience. And, you know, thinking, thinking about now, like, um, you know, obviously it's a very different kind of uh, uh, landscape in terms of all of that. But I, I always like kind of looking at the historical background on these things and be thinking, you know, there was a time, you know, <laughs> when when uh, when people were very sort of wordplay oriented uh, in terms of, you know, thinking about whether it's anagrams or palindromes or whatever, um, these different sort of wordplay forms were just sort of like popular entertainment of a particular kind. And I think that speaks to the fact that the audience for this sort of thing can be very broad. It doesn't have to be members of the National Puzzlers League or... Wordle. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, as <laughs> case in point, um, who would have guessed that the you know the viral sensation of 2022 would be a word game that has its roots in a pencil and paper game called Jotto back uh, from the 1950s, and uh, you know that that would be the thing to sort of like grab this kind of worldwide attention. But I mean, we we see things like this certainly in terms of um, just uh, I'm sure Anthony, you can. Uh, can uh, speak to this, but you know, just sort of being on social media and presenting wordplay finds um, can, you know, just that is enough to to sort of go viral. You know, like a, a, a beautiful palindrome or anagram uh, fits the uh, the limits of a of a tweet quite nicely, um, and that can spread and be enjoyed by a huge audience. And so, um, you know, yeah. what that that's something through beyond wordplay. I think that we're attempting to tap into not just the kind of the the traditional type of wordplay communities, but tapping into this much broader sort of love of wordplay that you find, you know, for people who are just sort of fascinated by, oh my goodness, that's that's a that's a palindrome, that's an anagram, and and you know that kind of uh, tinkering with words is something that I think is universal, really. Social media has really helped bring it back a bit. Uh, I think a lot of people would be surprised to hear that crosswords have been around for only just over a hundred years. Uh, yes, that's right. Do you think they, in a way that they've pushed all other forms of wordplay aside and that's been a problem? Well, it's it's funny, I guess in a way, thinking about it historically, crosswords came in, um, you know, uh, you know, originally in New York world and what was it, 19, I'm forgetting the exact date, was it 1912? I remember writing about the 100th anniversary of it, but then the actual craze starts in like around 1924 when Simon & Schuster uh, publishes uh, their crossword books. Uh, so uh, when that craze takes off, it does in a way kind of push out other wordplay forms. It's almost like the Beatles showing up uh, in like Beatlemania in 1964 and suddenly all, you know, the whatever whatever people were doing in rock and roll is sort of rendered uh, obsolete somehow. I don't know. So uh, yeah, the, the, the tradition I was talking about of word puzzles in verse, which the NPL keeps going, um, that certainly fell by the wayside, although that was probably a bit more abundant by the time that crosswords showed up in the 20s. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's always going to be sort of um, trends in word puzzles and word games. Of course, uh, Eric can speak to uh, Scrabble as another example of that, of course. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's interesting to to see, yeah, cross crosswords do dominate a lot of the wordplay discourse. Um, course, you know, American style or British style cryptic crosswords um, have their own audiences. But, um, you know, uh, what I have found is that, you know, there, there's this very, very vital kind of crossword community in the U.S. and other countries. And that is um, that has been very uh, it, it's been very interesting to see that kind of grow with the help of social media and Twitch streams and that sort of thing. Um, but that sometimes can be a kind of a gateway drug into other forms of wordplay. You know, you could start with American style crosswords and then you could say, hmm, well, I hear these cryptic crosswords. They're a little uh, more interesting. And that will open you up to all the different sort of wordplay uh, mechanisms that power crossword clues in cryptics. And next thing you know, you're, you know, you're thinking, well, this is a charade. And, this, you know, you're, you're familiar with the various kind of wordplay forms through that. 
And uh, yeah, National Fuzzlers League, for instance, I think has uh, been seeing a kind of a, a growth in its membership, even though it's this, you know, it's been kind of in the background all this time. But there are various things that are kind of feeding into that where people are getting more serious about wordplay and seeking out new communities. Picking up on what Ben said, I think America at least, and maybe, you know, Anthony, you can sort of give us your sense of how, where the UK falls in this. They sort of like to um, front. Americans will act like they don't have time for this, you know, they're too cool for that stuff. But every couple of years, there's another sort of word nerdy phenomenon going on, whether it's, you know, Scrabulous, which kind of, you know, took the online mojo from Hasbro and popularized, you know, Scrabble on Facebook and other, you know, in other places. Or even Scrabble itself, as Ben was mentioning, after the crossword phase in the in the fifties, when there was sort of this post-war kind of uh, American boom, um, you know, Scrabble became an enormous craze, you know, and it was showing up in all sorts of media and you know everyone's home. And in fact, you know, I, I had I became involved in the tournament Scrabble circuit in my younger years and wound up covering it and making a documentary about it called Word Wars, and um, it was. I wouldn't say based on, but it was certainly a parallel effort with um, the book that Stefan Fatsis had written called Word Freak. And I, I had met Stefan, you know, he he was kind of embedding himself in the tournament Scrabble community and we became friends and met a lot of the same people. And, you know, he wrote the book form of it. And as I saw that, you know, what a great job he was doing and what real entertainment was there, I said, I got to, you know, I was a budding filmmaker at the time. I said, I, you know, this is kind of a world that I know, I want to cover it. And as part of researching that, Talking to the people at Hasbro, which is based in Springfield, uh, Massachusetts, which happens to be the locus of another important Ben. I thought Ben was going to chime in right on Springfield, Massachusetts, but it's the home of Merriam-Webster. Yes, well. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so, so you know, ha having this very um, kind of American sort of centric word game right where the dictionary home base is, is a, a happy circumstance. But they'll tell you that for many, many years, Scrabble sets, they could predict how many Scrabble sets they were going to sell by the home buying rate because everyone, you know, you bought a home, you bought a Scrabble set. So I think that there is a very well entrenched, um, you know, sense of, of love for wordplay in the American populace. And I think at beyond wordplay, and we'll get into why we specifically called it beyond wordplay. It has to do with Dimitri Borgman. Our, our goal was to reach not the broadest audience of, you know, what we would call sort of the the, the airport Dell puzzle, you know, word search puzzle book audience, but sort of that intermediate audience of probably listening to Will Shorts do Sunday puzzles on NPR, you know, that there, there are really, you know, there, there really is a broad audience for that. And Wordle is a great example of, of that. So our goal has been to possibly use the word, I might use the word curate the best and brightest of examples we've seen being so plugged into all the different tentacles of the wordplay community and you know brought us to you anthony we appreciate the top-notch wordplay and we feel that wordplay is having kind of a moment which the online scenes the communities have been you know uh, enabled to flourish and um you know we really wanted to take our love and our history with it and use that to become sort of a center point um, for connecting uh, you know, whether it's what you're doing with constrained poetry and re re rejuvenating the whole art of the palindrome, the palindrome the anagrams, the letter banks, scrabble grams, as well as standard, you know, Ben does a great job of sort of covering the, the whole, all the goings on in online and offline puzzle communities. And, you know, we wanted to bring that all together with a sense of history as well, you know, of where it all came from. I, I think we would be remiss if we didn't talk about Wordle a bit more because <laughs> of how popular it is now. But what are your thoughts on it as a puzzle? Well, I, I could start with that. Um, uh, when when Wordle first hit in, uh, uh, maybe, you know, it sort of started going viral in December 2021, um, the, the the folks that uh, Eric and I uh, follow on Facebook or Twitter, they're, they're, you know, they tend to be uh, early adopters for uh, new puzzles that are out there. And uh, yeah, I remember seeing uh, friends starting to uh, publish their results because in, in December, that's when um, the uh, that's when Wordle uh, started to have the emoji squares being something that you could share on Facebook or Twitter or wherever you'd like. And that, of course, has taken over everyone's social media feed since then. So watching it really, really take off so that it felt like the entire world was playing it and often posting, posting their results on Twitter it was fascinating to sort of watch uh, take off. I, I uh, 
was able to uh, speak to the creative Wordle, whose name is Josh Wardle, one letter off from Wordle, W-A-R-D-L-E, um, as part of a podcast that I'm involved in uh, for Slate called Spectacular Vernacular. And uh, uh, even though Josh Wardle wasn't doing a lot of press, he uh, he spoke to uh, my co-host, Nicole Holiday and me. We were able to uh, sort of get the inside story about how he came up with it. And, you know, he's he's a mild-mannered fellow, originally from Wales, now living in Brooklyn, a uh, software uh, developer who uh, was just, you know, coming up with this game for for something that he and his partner could uh, play during the pandemic. Um, they were, you know, entranced by some other, you know, it's like, for instance, the New York Times spelling bee is a very sort of popular popular uh, word puzzle that's that's uh, taken off. And in a way, it's sort of uh, modeled on that as as uh, kind of a bite-sized bit of wordplay that you could get every day. Uh, you have to come back for it. It leaves you wanting more with a very simple, elegant design. I think the design has a lot to do with its viral success because, again, it's a it's something that, you know, for for old uh, hands in, in wordplay and word puzzles, they'll be like, oh, yeah, this is Jada or this is Lingo, uh, a game show uh, from the 1980s, which was bas basically Jado, uh, and then was revived later by the Game Show Network. Uh, so, you know, this the, the form of it certainly isn't new, but you don't necessarily need something brand new in terms of the form if the kind of the the interface is such that it, it um, you know, taps into uh, this particular enjoyment that people have in finding their way towards a solution and then sharing how they got to that solution in a, in a way it it uh it taps into something i think that that people uh people enjoy about this sort of thing where it's not simply like oh i figured this thing out it's like oh this is the way i figured it out and it might be different from the way you figured it out and we all have our own like methods and uh of of reaching that solution um and so uh so yeah and and the latest of course is that the new york times uh acquired wordle uh, Josh Wardle had just been doing it as this independent venture on his own website. Um, and this acquisition, uh, which was in the uh, reported as being in the low seven figures in U.S. dollars for the acquisition of Wordle, uh, shows also the value <laughs> that that uh, can be placed on something that um, that, you know, has this kind of uh, uh, mass of, of interest in it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's it's a particularly spectacular example of the way that wordplay can uh, kind of capture the attention of, of people. But again, we've seen it in the past. I mean, the, the crossword craze of the 1920s was all consuming. People wrote songs about it. I, it was, uh, you know, it was it was a true mass phenomenon there as well. And, you know, perhaps Scrabble to some extent was like that as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it, it's been really interesting just to watch it all develop over the past few months. Although Rush wrote a song called Anagram, and that did not, that, as far as we know, spark an <laughs> anagram craze. So it's hard to predict. Although, you know, the, they might be giants, wrote I, Palindrome I. Anthony, yeah. I don't know, Did you were you around for that? Did you see any bump in it's, Palindrome yeah. space oh, at that time? I, no. Not at the time, but I, I've yeah. since heard it, yeah. For me, Wordle has, it has these three great qualities that make it so perfectly marketable. One is the fact that you can tweet your result, you can share your results without sharing the answer. Right. Which is quite amazing. The other one, Ben, you pointed out, is that it's warm the day. You can't just sit there and spend a whole day doing a hundred of them until you're sick of it. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would argue, and I don't know what you think about this, but with, with six chances, it's actually quite easy. You're not going to get many wrong. So it's a challenge, but it's not so challenging that people are going to give up on it. Yeah, that's a good point. I would say that's true. And uh, I think it, I think six is sort of the perfect number for it, too, because a lot of people just get it on the sixth try and, and that gives them the sense of, oh, you know, just just made it, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, uh, you might sort of poo poo it as not being, you know, uh, particularly challenging, but uh, but I, I think the fact that people approach it in very different ways. So people who are like working at a, at a kind of a higher level will, you know, uh, will be trying to find kind of the optimal play of, uh, you know, the, the fewest number of terms. And, and, and there have been lots of articles written about, you know, with what's the best strategy, which words can you start with? 
Um, and uh, so I think the fact that it can appeal to people on all, all these different levels, kind of, uh, you can get sort of really deep into it like that, or it can just be, again, a way of just kind of uh, sharing something with uh, family and friends. I, that was something in the interview with Josh Wardle that he said that even more than just people sharing results on uh, Twitter and Facebook, he's heard a lot of people just doing it in kind of like group messages, uh, you know, that it's something that, you know, families or, or, or small groups of friends like to, you know, share every day. And that becomes, again, in these times, a way that we can connect with each other uh, that, you know, which has been so challenging uh, over the past couple of years. I mean, that's something we can get into, obviously, kind of the pandemic era boom in interest in wordplay. Uh, we've seen it in all sorts of different venues and forms of social media and, you know, wordplay communities and Wordle, I think, reflects that as well. There was an amazing stat you can point to that kind of puts it all together, which is probably, Ben will know, but maybe three months in, you know, into the craze, the number one most searched word on the Merriam-Webster dictionary, online dictionary site was the Wordle word of the day. And that may have been true for a few days. I don't know how often it may still be true, but, you know, the fact that it, you can measure sort of the pop culture um, popularity of a word craze, you know, by that metric, is sort of an amazing thing. It's pulling the it's it's pulling so much attention, you know, that it's literally the most searched word word of the day. And it's also nice to see that uh, because uh, Josh Wardle kind of designed it to be this kind of open source uh, software that the various clones that have been created and uh, we've all seen so many different variations on the theme. Some of them quite clever, uh, some of them just kind of silly. But it, you know, it's like this whole like uh, ecosystem of Wordle type games. And uh, that's just lovely to see. Again, it's like people take, a, again, a kind of a simple, elegant notion and say, okay, I'm going to come up with my own spin on it. Um, and so now, yeah, I mean, again, among, among the kind of uh, wordplay aficionados who I follow on Facebook, they'll be saying, well, here's my Dordal score. Here's my Quartal score, you know, all the <laughs> variations on it. Um, some, some are... Absurdal is a wonderful one. You're right. That's the adversarial one where it where uh, where it tries to extend it as long as possible before it, you know you catch it in 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 a word. Uh, yeah, that that yeah. Just it seems like every day still there are new ones popping up. There are of course ones in in dozens of different languages as well because all you need is a word list and you too can implement uh, Wordle in in a new language. <laughs> There's a Basque uh, one which I thought was great. Considering Basque is like supposedly this language isolate related to no other, you know, known language. And there it is with a Wordle. So. Yeah, and linguists have, uh, uh, I've seen, I think, two different versions of this, but using the International Phonetic Alphabet uh, and uh, uh, using that rather than letters. So you have to figure out which five IPA symbols for a word with five phonemes uh, is, is the word of the day. Uh, that, it, you know, it, even knowing IPA, that is super challenging. But, but uh but yeah, it's 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 again, it's like it, there's something really. I mean, as Eric was saying, wordplay is having its moment. I think there are just various tools that we have at our disposal now that uh, that allow something to just like take off and keep taking off. You know, people with time on their hands are like, let me come up with my own wordle variation, that sort of thing. And enough people have kind of the tech savvy to figure it out. It might not require a lot of tech savvy. Uh, again, it could just require you know knowing a bit of coding and have access to. A word list or some other other thing that you want to tinker with, and boom, you have your own you have your own word game. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's it's wonderful to see that. Uh, of course, Wordle has generated a kind of a backlash out of overexposure, kind of saturating the market. But the flip side is that again is yeah, people seem to have endless fun with it and coming up with you know new ways to twist it. It was in a, a Saturday Night Live weekend update did a Wordle joke. I mean, that's kind of the pinnacle of like sat pop culture saturation right there. It's sort of amazing. I was I was just reading the other day that membership of online chess clubs has gone up about 70% in the last two years because of the pandemic. So surely that's also going to be true of online Scrabble, for example. Well, I mean, I okay. Know about that. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I don't know. I, I haven't been in touch with the, I mean, I consider myself you know, kind of an honorary lifetime member of the general Scrabble community because I, I stay connected to people in it, but I haven't been as involved in the inner workings of that organized group for a little while. But when certainly when I was 
making the film and in the wake of that for many years, um, there were a lot of goings on that are, so I would put in the political realm of organizations cropping up and splintering off. And um, I, I don't know, I, the, the tournament scene per se suffered obviously from um, both that aspect and the inability to have in-person tournaments. I don't know if there's been a corresponding boom in online play, but well, one would I mean, again, again I, I have a very outsider's perspective on it, but I, but I mean, I do know that the ability to, I, I'm blanking out on the name of the platform that's used these days uh, for sort of online oh, yeah. Scrabble tournaments, but th there are there are platforms that have made it easier to host it. Uh, um, there has been a bit of, um, what was that called? Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm blanking out on it too, but but the, the uh, I, th I think that goes along with what we were talking about in terms of like uh, sort of the kind of the technological infrastructure that allows people to get together um, on, and this is true of chess as well, of course, um, these various kind of pastimes. You can be anywhere in the world and connect with other people. You can be following the best people in the world at that particular pastime by just going on their Twitch stream or whatever. Um, that cuts across all of these different uh, different pursuits, I would say. Woogles. That's it. Yes. yes. Yeah, that's it. That's what people yes. are using these days for for online Scrabble tournaments. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you look at the crossword world, you have obviously crossword uh, software and other resources that have kind of uh, perhaps democratized the ability to create pretty decent crosswords and um, this very vibrant community of, of folks who these days very often are uh, get, get, getting together uh, on Twitch streams and Discord servers and that sort of thing. And uh, it's just, I, it's exciting to just be a part of that, even kind of as an observer um, to, you know, see that all happening and the, the, just the, the ferment uh, that of people just, a lot of young people, which is great to see. I mean, the, there are lots of like, you know, fresh blood coming in of, of people who are just in, getting their feet wet and, um, and discovering all of this great wordplay. And there's a couple other major pillars of these, this sort of public awareness of wordplay that we could mention. Certainly the New York Times, which we obliquely mentioned, you know, which bought the Wordle, has done an amazing job in recent years. I mean, it was always the destination for, you know, what you sort of might have considered the elitist uh, level of wordplay. Doing the Times crossword was always a bit of a, maybe elitist is too strong a word, but it was, it was not sort of the broadest appeal. But they've done an amazing job in recent years in adding to what's called New York Times uh, games, I think. Um, and, you know, they've got different puzzle type spelling bee we mentioned, which really have taken off and, and, and established these incredibly broad audiences and online participation and all that. And so they've established themselves as a center point. You know, Will Shorts, who is also a he's the historian, actually, of the National Puzzlers League. Um, as Ben, so so this this actually connects to something Ben and I are near and dear to, which is Games Magazine. We we got familiar with Will Shorts because he was the editor of Games Magazine starting in 1977, and then through I think even through the early 90s. Um, and you quickly learned about Will. Um, we sometimes call him Will's, uh, capital W I L L sh short Z. That's his nom in the um, in the NPL. But oh, yeah, um, NP NPLers uh, all have noms, which are just, you know, nom de plumes. Again, this is a practice going back to the uh, 19th century, where if you were writing a puzzle, you wouldn't use your real name. And so that's another tradition that's kept alive. It's sort of similar to, you know, cryptic crossword setters all have their own, their uh, pen names as well. So yeah, Wills is how we refer to Will Shorts uh, in NPL circles. I'm surprised you went with nom de plumes as as opposed to nom <laughs> Nom de plume, but okay, we can talk about that later. <laughs> um, so we we got to know Will in that context, or became aware of Will in that context, and he was well known as being at that time the only person with a degree in enigmatology. So he had gone to Indiana University. I think that was a graduate degree. Then you might know. Uh, no, I was actually was uh, he created yeah. his own undergraduate major, and then he went on to law school uh, before giving that okay. up and deciding he would go full into puzzles. So Will is like <laughs> a pied, Will's like a Pied Piper for us. <laughs> You know, the, the things that he's done to popularize uh, the, all the various forms of wordplay, you know, he's kind of considered the, the Pied Piper of all this. Um, and so Games, I forgot where I branched off on this point, but Games Magazine was certainly an entry point for many of us. 
And oh, so I was mentioning the New York Times. So obviously, Will took over the editorship of the the crossword puzzle. Ben knows the exact year, I'm sure, off the top of his head. But I, uh, I always have... forget. Was it ninety three? I want to say 93. sounds about right. Sounds about right. So <laughs> yeah, um, 93 is right. <laughs> yeah. And, and they've really they've broadened out their content there. Another really amazing, um, you know, place that uh, Americans just gravitate toward wordplay is the National Spelling Bee, the Scripps National Spelling Bee, which Ben is uh, is is now a, a part of and can speak more to. But that's just another example of like we may play it off like we're not word nerds. But the bottom line is America loves a good word competition, especially if you throw kids in it. <laughs> I have met Will Shorts. I met him at the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament, where, of course, uh, in 2017, we had a palindrome championship, which yes. seemed like a very minor thing. I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't quite prepared when I walked in there, but just what a big deal the crossword tournament is. And people took it yeah. really seriously. You could see how seriously they were taking this. And in fact, uh, this year, um, Will, who runs that and has run it since it started um, um, in the late 70s um, is bringing back the in-person uh, American Crossword Puzzle Tournament in Stamford, Connecticut. And going along with that will be another World uh, Palindrome Championship. So this will be the third, I guess it's uh, the way that uh, Mark Saltfight has uh, been running it, uh, that it's every five years now. Cause, so the first one, is that right? Yeah, let's see, I think. I think uh, 2012, yeah. 2012 and then 2017 was uh, the one that so you were in attendance for that one in 2017 for the one that the palindromists documentary was uh, was capturing um, yeah. and then and now we'll have the third one this year. I'm still trying to figure out if I'm going this year because of the <laughs> for obvious reasons, shall we say. Uh, but yeah. It's a very interesting community that you have all these people this obsessed with it. And Eric, uh, guess what film I just watched today? Well, I'm hoping from that one that it's Word Wars, but it, you know, I don't want to be yes. arrogant and assume that you did that. So, it's I a great, guess. it's a great film. Why, thank you. Uh, there are some interesting characters. I'll say. Yes, I mean, first of all, those are my people. So I, I always respond to like, well, it seemed like you were kind of trying for some cheap shots here or there. Blah blah blah. I was like, this is you want to see cheap shot like. If you only knew the reality and what I cut out and didn't show, <laughs> you know, like that's those, there were some cheap shots to be had or what, you know, this is just my love letter to word wars was my love letter to that community. I'm a part of it. I, I was, I don't consider myself separate from it better than it above it. Um, I, I wasn't trying to tell the story as a journalist. I wanted people to feel like they were in the rooms I always, I mean, I, at the time, I, I have kind of a half creative, half technical technology, you know, technology background. If I could make it all creative and still feed my family, you know, well, then I would, but I've gone back and forth in different things. At that time I was acting and I, I, I grew up as an actor and, and I think of things in terms of story, character, uh, you know, dramatic moment. So even when I was sitting there in these rooms, you know, at these tournaments, I was thinking like there's a story going on right now like I would here's how I would shoot this and you know here's the dramatic tension so the thing that binds the people is it doesn't matter what your social background is what where you come from you know whether mm. you're peop whether you're a Latin professor from the Boston area which I'm thinking of a specific person a forklift salesman from Texas uh, you know, or Marlon who came from call them the streets of Baltimore not the best part of Baltimore um, it's easy to sort of, you know, fetishize that whole thing, but, you know, legitimately I, I visited him this year and, you know, it's not the nicest part of Baltimore. Let's just say that, um, you know, there's not a lot of Scrabble being played there, but the love, th the way that the brain works, the way the brain wraps itself around these words. I mean, Anthony, you know, this, we, uh, you know, from your passions and your pursuits and, you know, what you do with words, there's something to the appreciation of not just the hard work that goes into it, the aesthetics. I mean, this is really a, a, a broader topic for Beyond Wordplay. We appreciate the art of it, the craft of it, the struggle of it, and the results of it when it's all put together. It's like when someone makes a play in Scrabble that's just like only, 
when you're at the top level, and I'm not saying I'm at the top level, I, I look up at the top level. I, I know who they are, and my goal was to communicate what they are able to do. I was never in the top level as far as my ability to execute. But um, when somebody makes a play that only three people in the world could make, you know it, people know it, they talk about it. I mean, I can give you some examples. Um, and they're not always the flashiest plays. I mean, I've played a 15-letter word, pat, 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 in reality, I was fishing for nests to stick on informative the whole game. And I, you know, so it's like that is that gets talked about sometimes, but that's not the elegance of it is not there. I, one of my best friends in the community in the Scrabble world was named Trey Wright or is named Trey Wright. Brilliant concert pianist. You know, his his brain is just phenomenal. I saw his study books. I mean, I have the same kind of study books. His are world championship level study books, you know, where he's literally just digesting the dictionary by alphagram, meaning you know, he's learning that, you know, if I just stuck with the eight letter words, A, 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 L, T, Y, you know, S, Y, Atalayas, boom, that's the first one alphabetically. And on through whatever Zizvas would be, you know, alphabetized. And that's how he's learning it. And he's writing things down in the margin and making associations. So it's like, that's how everyone at the top level prepares there. But I think of a play where the word, and I saw him do this at some low level, you know, just weekend tournament this was not a nationals no one would know about this play it's not in the lore the word alp alp was on the board and you know it's the board is all jammed up and he's got some rack of stuff and he's down by about 30 points and with all rights his opponent's going to close out the game and win it and he finds a way to make the word enthalpy e-n-t-h-a-l-p-y hooking probably three or four of those letters onto other words finding like a 50 something point play out of playing five tiles to know the word enthalpy is one thing i still i'm not sure i know what the word enthalpy means <laughs> but to see it on the board the board vision that that took in context with the clock running to pick, pull a game out that's like world-class level stuff that's like you know give me your favorite footballer you know whatever bend it like beckham you know it's like it's at that level. We appreciate it. Words are a context board for us, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so that's the kind of thing that really drew me to want to make the movie and connects the people in that world. The people at the top level of that game and really broadly appreciate that level of facility with words, you know. I enjoy playing Scrabble a lot, but I don't. Don't think worry, it... we'll beat it. We'll beat it out of you. <laughs> I don't. I don't think I'm ever, I'll ever be tempted to get to the stage where I'm memorizing dictionaries and you know all those well, short words that you never use in real life. That it's a rite of passage. I I, re I remember. I can I can tell you the moment. I mean, I was a casual, you know, home Scrabble player. I grew up in a family of my mom was a quasi professional bridge player, if you want to call it that. I mean, a very serious bridge player, like you know, sort of winning national events and things like that. Um, and many of the adults I knew were game players, whether they were options traders or went to the horse track or, you know, chess or word, word games. There was a lot of games going on. And bridge was too dangerous for me to go into because I knew a lot of unhealthy adults that, you know, were way too obsessed with bridge. So um, I went in the opposite direction. Well, I went in another direction, which was words. So by the time I got to college, um, you know, I was like, OK, I can play some Scrabble. I love these words. And I sat down and I was getting like regularly beaten by, you know, by, you know, I, I don't want to disparage anybody, but like the department secretary of the geology department, you know, who was playing in the Scrabble Club with her cigarette going like, oh, look, there's an eight letter word there, you know, and I was like getting my butt kicked and I was like, I better it's now or never. So then you realize, oh, they just study these lists and you got to do it. If you want to be in this world, you got to study. And then it just becomes, do you love words? Because... It's not like homework. You're just learning words. And it's, it's interesting. It, they don't necessarily learn the definition of the words. Yeah, that, that, this looking. is a this is something, too. I mean, if you talk about like the Scrabble community versus uh, crosswords and and I, I love both. But uh, I know that crossword people sometimes look down a bit on Scrabble for that exact reason that if it's a question of I, again this is a bit of a stereotype or exaggeration <laughs> no one can see my thumbs down gesture on this podcast <laughs> but but you know i mean uh the the type of people who do well at scrabble um have a particular kind of brain which is an incredible brain but uh but yeah in, in terms of like the meaning of the words obviously 
it's important on some level. On another level, maybe it just gets in the way of the kind of memorization that you have to do, as long as you know that this is the type of noun that takes an S or whatever. Um, and, you know, there are plenty of examples, of course, of, you know, people who's, uh, who have uh, English as a second language. Um, their, their proficiency doesn't have to be great in order to be, you know, you could be from, you know, there are many great uh, Scrabble players from Thailand and other countries, or, or the example, of course, of Nigel Richards uh, deciding that he wants to uh, enter French Scrabble tournaments and ends up uh, winning French Scrabble without knowing French. Yeah, so like, so something like that, it's incredible. It's, it's mind boggling. Uh, at the same time, uh, from the kind of the, the crossworders perspective, it's like, well, that is a, that's a different type of uh, feat, I suppose, yeah, you know, ch that's than, than uh, yeah. And so it's more of a combinatorial type thing and, and uh, also yeah, involving um, huge amounts of, of memorization of, of the words in whatever word list you're using. Um, whereas uh, the the top people in Scrabble, like you know, this is, you know, we, so we talked about Word Wars, Eric's uh, documentary. Of course, there's a documentary Wordplay about the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament, um, and uh, you can sort of see the you know the the top minds at work you know at that time, and the ones that are the best now are incredible in their own way in terms of uh, the ability to sort of. Um, you know, retrieve just, you know, based on clues, retrieve the words that should go in and manage to fill a grid, you know, faster than uh, you can imagine. And and uh, and so there, there's, I mean, there, there's something really incredible about those kind of uh, intellectual feats. Um, at the same time, I think, um, you know, what makes, a, you know, whether it's Eric's uh, documentary or the wordplay documentary about crossword so compelling isn't just necessarily Oh, these these amazing minds at work, but the kind of the kind of interesting communities and all the different personalities that go into it, the human the human aspect of that. And I and we could say the same thing about the Palindromists uh, documentary uh, capturing capturing that uh, you know perhaps smaller world of people obsessed with palindromes. But uh, yeah, I think well, that's there what I enjoyed about that. There are only eight of us in there. But it, it still it still amazed me with only eight of us that we all liked each other. We all got on. We all had a good time. Together. <laughs> well, it would have like... been funny, although if there was a rivalry among, you know, two or more of the eight palindromists, that would have been the, you know, that would have been great movie fodder. Well, there was a, there were, you know, the, the, the documentarians for the palindromists, I know, chose to focus on just that small number of people when they could have included others, including people who happened to be at ACPT that weekend, like me. Uh, I was interviewed for it, as was my son, Blake. Uh, those were left on the cutting room floor, although uh, there's a, kind of a deleted scene, perhaps for you know a DVD bonus that uh, they shared with me, where my son, Blake, who at the time was, I guess, 10 going on 11, because now he's 15 going on 16, um, he was just getting into palindromes uh, and was starting to make his own and they interviewed him and they asked him, you know, what's your favorite palindrome? And without without hesitating, he said, uh, go hang a salami, I'm a lasagna hog. And then they're like, hey, you know, the creator of that palindrome is right here, John Agee. And then they captured on film, you know, Blake getting to meet John Agee and talk about Blake's favorite palindrome. It was this lovely little moment. See, but, but if it uh, was me, I, I would have got somebody <laughs> going, Agee's a hack. If you got to put it in a book, it's not real anyway. What is this? <laughs> you know, whatever. I don't know. I would have tried, tried to find something going on there. But no, a a G, John real. Agee, uh, like, you know, used that as the title of one of his palindrome books. And I, I had shared that with Blake and he loved it. Uh, and uh, and so, yeah, there, there, was, there were a lot of moments that uh, beyond just the core uh, palindrome competitors in that movie that they they could have shown, but you know the same with these other movies like Wordplay. You got to have recognizable people that you can follow throughout the documentary, so you don't get too confused uh, with you know lots of uh, secondary characters and that sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> I, I did uh, want to pick up on the the whole notion of like whether people learn the uh, definitions or not um, in Scrabble. I think. It's become a trope, and certainly, as Ben pointed out, there are certain kinds of minds that are like, uh, you know, the photographic memory type things where people literally are just hoovering it off the page, as it were. Um, but really, I think it's a little bit overplayed. I, I think most of the people, if you scratch them, really enjoy the words, enjoy the definitions. It, Yes, you're studying word lists of, okay, if I have the rack, uh, you know, retains, 
what you know you what are all the uh they call them anemonics so you might take all the letters that combine with it and create a little sentence so that you can immediately know if you've got retains plus an a it's you know you know retains plus a b banister plus a c canister etc 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 um but that's one aspect of scrabble study another of it is just riffing on words hanging out and the definitions are absolutely um you know part of that just the love of of the interesting connections between things in the real world that you learn as you are also studying what you can do with the letters. And I would say uh, there is an easy parallel to make actually with spelling bees, which Eric brought up before. So we're not talking about the New York Times spelling bee game. We're talking about actual spelling bees. So as Eric mentioned, I'm now involved with the Scripps National Spelling Bee, the the organization that um, you know that oversees uh, regional spelling bees, which all feed into the national finals, which uh, in the US gets a lot of attention. Uh, they're all kids, you know, uh, through uh, going only through eighth grade. They can't be older than eighth graders. And there's a similar type of stereotype. It's like uh, all these kids are doing is memorizing words in a dictionary. In the case of uh, the National Spelling Bee, um, the Dictionary of Record is Webster's New International Third Edition, unabridged, the, the great unabridged dictionary for Merriam-Webster. Um, that's a lot of words to memorize. Nobody actually memorizes the whole dictionary. They all come up with, you know, various, um, you know, techniques for um, trying to study um, the spelling, spelling of as many words as possible, words that they expect will show up um, uh, at the top levels. And it's incredible, you know, um, the, 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 the kids who do have the ki kinds of minds to, to pull this off at the same time. Um, it's not just rote memorization. Um, uh, they, they certainly are getting into the meanings of words, and that's actually how I got involved with it, because um, uh, to kind of emphasize the fact that this is about not just mastery of the spelling of words, but also the meaning, um, they started to introduce um, questions as part of the spelling bee um, that quizzed the kids on the meanings of words. Um, and so you could present a word and have sort of, you know, multiple choice which one uh, matches the meaning of the word. Um, and that's another way to get at the kind of mastery of the lexicon that these kids were undertaking. And so I've been overseeing that. And that's now a feature of kind of every stage of the competition. You get these vocabulary questions or word meaning questions. And that's been really gratifying to be a part of because, again, I mean, it, it really does show that for these kids, they love words. They they all you know can ask them what's your favorite word. They'll know not just how to spell it, but uh, uh, you know so it's wacky meanings or uh, uh, you know various things that they've come across just by you know they might not be paging through the print dictionary the way Eric and I did when we were kids. They may just be using the the online version of it, but it's the same type of exploration and discovery and sort of serendipity of finding cool words like I can't believe there's a word for this and. And uh, it, this, the spelling bee definitely taps into that same kind of love of words. How, how do you cope with homophones? Because the way I understand uh, it, they, they are allowed to ask for a definition. Yes. Okay. Yeah. If in in sort of the spe uh, spelling <laughs> questions for spelling, if uh, if there are homophones involved, um, they will let you know, um, and then you know provide the provide the meaning so that uh, uh, you know which one you're supposed to be spelling. Yeah. So that. Um, in some cases, there there are some words that just might be kind of off limits because they might be too difficult to deal with in terms of spelling variants and that sort of thing. But if you're dealing with homophones that have, you know, distinct meanings, then that can be distinguished just through, you know, telling them the uh, uh, the meaning of the word. So, yeah. So yeah, I'd like well, I'd like to get back to styles of wordplay because, of course, most people know about cryptic crosswords. Most people know about Scrabble. With the NPL, what sorts of things go on there that, that perhaps the general public won't have heard of? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, the secret laboratory of wordplay. Uh, ben, do you have any top ones? I mean, well, I've got a list. I made, I made a list to prep for this <laughs> of sort of wordplay types. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, w w if you go to beyondwordplay.com, you'll see that some of these uh, wordplay forms we kind of devoted, you know, Eric, Eric, this is kind of his specialty of kind of deep dives into particular wordplay forms, and they may get their start um, in the National Puzzlers League and sometimes get wider attention. One one nice example I, of that would be letter banks. 
Um, so uh, letter banks, uh, you know, uh, where you can you start with uh, a shorter word or phrase that is isogrammatic, meaning it doesn't have any repeated letters, and then you can create larger words or phrases um, using those letters repeated as many times as necessary. So lens can get you senselessness, that sort of thing. Um, that is a wordplay form that uh, you know came on the scene only uh, what was it 1981 uh, at an NPL convention. Um, Will Shorts uh, uh, was 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 instrumental in that. Uh, Eric can can do this history better than I can, but I mean that's an example of one where it's like it was it it became a kind of a type of wordplay that people in the National Puzzle League would use just to create these these word puzzles in verse the flats. Um, but now we see it extending in other places, and so uh, there, there are various cryptic crossword uh, constructors that are using letter banks as a as a kind of wordplay, for instance. Um, and uh, yeah, Eric, Eric has plenty well, more to say about letter. Well, banks. I, I mean, we could either riff on all the different types of wordplay, which you know I don't know how much time we have, but just to stay with letter banks for a minute, just to give people out there a sense of the art that can be involved here. Just I, I think if we focus on a couple of well-chosen examples, people can start to see like, oh, that's cool. Like I found when I was making uh, Word Wars, it was all about just picking a good example. So very early on, we dropped like a visual of, you know, turning narcoleptic into Eric Clapton. Well, he's a loaded term now, but you know, he wasn't at that time. He was just a guitarist. But, um, you know, so when people have something they can kind of hang on to that's sort of a pop culture reference, like when you guys are talking about palindromists, I'm literally just sitting here thinking, is no one going to mention that Isabel, I was waiting that, for you to mention it that Ingrid Bergman's daughter is named Pia Lindstrom, which is an anagram of palindromist, and she was a in the New York area kind of a noted film reviewer for for a long time. But anyway, so with letter banks, it, it I think it helps to kind of throw out some of the gems. So you can start with um, you're familiar with the term a schmear, Anthony. It's kind of a a New York Yiddishism. You know, I'll have a schmear on my bagel. Well, OK, that's spelled S-C-H-M-E-A-R. So I just gave this as a little puzzle to one of my kids. Uh, the other day we were sitting in a diner. She got a bagel with a, with a schmear. I said, here, take these letters. You can use them as many times as you want. You have to use all of them at least once. What can you make? It's a two word phrase. I wrote out the blanks for her. It took a little while. So Anthony, what can you make out of schmear? Am I Something putting you on the spot? That's a, you all put me on the spot. Oh, I don't think I'm not putting Anthony. Is it etherin or etherin? Ethereum. Oh, I, I do not expect that. I didn't expect to be putting you on the spot. So we've got Schmear, S-C-H-M-E-A-R. Feel, feel free to take out your pen or pencil. Okay, so what two word phrase can you make out of the letters in Schmear that is quite appropriate? Cream cheese. So the fact that a Schmear of cream cheese is you just Schmear it around and you get the phrase cream cheese. To me, Look, if there's any evidence that, you know, God is living within in the in the things we're doing, that's it. It's too beautiful that there's not some reason for it. But there's other beautiful things like the letters in Bronte, like Emily Bronte, you can make to be or not to be. Um, the head of the Federal Reserve Bank for uh, a while there, I don't exactly, I can't remember exactly when, but if you take the letters in the word banker, B-A-N-K-E-R, the head of the U.S. Federal Reserve was named Ben Bernanke, you can make that. So I, I think people start to, if you pull examples where form and function are related, you know, where the topical aspect gets related to the wordplay, people start to gravitate towards it and then you can get them a little hooked. So those are some yeah. letter bank examples I love. Well, these letter banks, uh, experimental poets will know this better as a lipogram. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, a type of lipogram called a beau present, which is the name that Ulipo gave it. Where you take you take someone's name and write a poem about them, just using the letters in their name. Well, Anthony, that's some of the stuff you've done so well. I mean, I think you're. You, uh, so we became aware of you. I think we were aware of. Is it Christian Book? Does he actually pronounce the umlaut? Or yes, I've never book. heard these names. Okay. So we be, I became aware of Unoya when it was published and thought, wow, so this is a guy taking this, you know, aspect of wordplay to the top level. And then uh, somehow we became aware of you and. Pedro Poitavan, uh, just on Twitter. We've never spoken except this is the first time, at least, you know, I don't know if Ben, you've spoken to either of those other guys, but taking the notion of aesthetics and uh, semantics, I guess I would say, meaning, and marrying it to form 
is what I think you've done so amazingly well and what we we groove on and respect and we want to connect you and other people doing that in different domains. So you mentioned the Olipo and that, you know, the taking somebody's name and writing a poem out of it. I mean, you've done some amazing constrained poetry. Yeah, I, I, we wanted to acknowledge. Uh, yeah, I mean, we <laughs> the 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 sort of palindromic poetry that you do is what I'm most familiar with. But I know you've you've created your own poetic forms and all sorts of things. And uh, yeah, Eric and I will sometimes just sort of share like, oh, did you see the latest tweet from Anthony? Oh, yeah. this, you know, elegant uh, little poem. And, uh, uh, you know, there's there's one that I think for 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 uh, Eric and I, I think both felt, you know, it was just sort of at the top of the, you know, the, the best palindromes, you know, perhaps ever in English. Um, uh, so because you know you've been making ones that have been topical and and it's one that i have in front of me just the one face mask which uh, oh yeah which you know was uh in 2020 in uh early pandemic times and when we were all uh learning to mask up and i'm just going to read it out because i i love it uh, put it on knot it up walks a man in a mask law put it on knot it up and just the sheer elegance of that, the fact that it tapped into, you know, what everyone was experiencing at that moment and created just a perfect a bit of verse about it. Um, I should mention that uh, I'm on the, the judges panel for the Simis, the palindrome uh, uh, competition that Mark Salfite runs every year. I, I voted that as, as my favorite uh, for 2020 and somehow a different palindrome by Anthony, which was a recipe for ragouts. Yeah, that ended up winning the grand prize, even though I, I was thought for sure the face mask one would win the grand prize. But I think that just won the, the poetry division. And, you know, Anthony, you were just you were just on fire that year. So you were you were, you were uh, your your palindromes were certainly at the top of that. But uh, I don't yeah. know if people. Uh, so one of the brilliant things about that level of wordplay or just of of poetry or creation is it works without reference to the underlying constraint. And that's the beauty of it. It's just, it's just an elegant sort of couplet or whatever, not couplet, but uh, whatever form it is, you know, it's an, it's an elegant piece. And then when you kind of spring the next aspect, like, wait, it literally reverses and it's, it's the same thing. That's what's brilliant about the aha moment that's there. People don't realize how much it takes to, and now we've segued from you asking about what goes on inside NPL to us acknowledging you, which is hopefully okay with you because I know we both. It's, it's embarrassing that. in a good way, you know. So you can be embarrassed a little bit. I mean, so wrong. Yeah. So, so, but we appreciate it. So you're not going to get two guys who really appreciate any more than we do what it takes to do something that seems so effortless. And I would imagine you've got whatever analogy, analog of snips of slips of paper sitting around. The only way, well, maybe with the face mask one, you might have been triggered to do it by you know an event. But the only way you can generate what you're doing on an ongoing basis is to have spent your 10,000 hours assembling snippets. And it's not like you could sit down and met, you know, will that level of thing to just come out of you. That's a yeah. lot of time. And of course, there are, there are lots of there are lots of palindromes that, I, that I've written that don't work that well. And you just when it all comes together, it's such a perfect moment because you've already had thousands of imperfect moments. I, I, liken it, I liken it to David Blaine, you know, who like when he's doing a trick, you just, it, you know, he tries to make it look, you know, he does whatever he can to make it look like, okay, he sort of just showed up and did a trick. I I, I was, I, I got a chance to meet him in real life once just in a, whatever, some context. You can see that dude is constantly t checking the room. You know, it's like literally he is over indexed on, you know, like, how he's going to maybe start one of those things. None of it is spontaneous. It is so well planned. And, you know, he's he's got his bag of tricks that he's, you know, pulled little things from from his whole life. And I would imagine you've got the same thing where, you know, you're noticing snippets, you're noticing fragments, you're noticing longer strings. And then, you know, you've got to you marry it with a topicality. And like you say, when it comes together, it's, you know, it's really amazing. So. I think that's what drew us to you, and I guess it's you know one of the reasons we got here. <laughs> was we yeah. appreciate what you're doing. And well, yeah, I was just going to say, I was going to say too. I mean, yeah, your your Twitter presence uh, was was easy to kind of easy entree, easy entry point for us and for other people. And it's just wonderful that you know, 
Twitter can be a cesspool. Twitter can be the worst of the worst. And yet, and yet, it allows for something like this, the sort of, you know, uh, beautiful palindromic verses that sort of fit the constraints of Twitter to be shared with the world. Um, you know, if you had come up with that face mask palindrome where, you know, in a world without social media, it's like, okay, well, it, it might have been, you know, shared in a magazine or a book or whatever. But uh, the fact that, again, you came up with this, this palindrome at this perfect time too, when, you know, people were also doing lots of different kinds of uh, pandemic related wordplay um, and that got shared. I don't know how many, I don't know how, how many, uh, you know, retweets or whatever that particular tweet of yours got, but it's just, you know, I can't remember, that, but I know it got, uh, it had over a thousand likes, which is the, only the second time that's happened to me. Right. Yeah, yeah. it's funny. I, I, I tweet about all sorts of things, you know, very often I'm tweeting about what my column for the Wall Street Journal is about, you know, since I write a weekly column on words in the news. But uh, yeah, some of my tweets that have gotten the most attention have just been kind of anagram observations on people's names in the news. I think during the Trump era in particular, uh, what I think, what, I don't know if this is still the, the tweet that got the most retweets of anything, but um, there was, uh, there was uh, uh, it, it was a protest against Trump and um, on his, uh, the hotel that he owns um, in DC, um, someone had basically projected the word shithole on it um, at the, this was at the time when Trump was reported to have been talking about shithole countries in Africa and people were rightfully very upset about, about that. Um, and so somebody projected that on his hotel and I just pointed out, well, shithole is an anagram of his hotel. And that was just something that I just, you know, tweeted in like 10 seconds without thinking about it. And, and that, that went viral, you know, so it's not, you know, as opposed to, you know, sometimes, you know, we labor over things and thinking what's going to, what's, what are people going to be? Uh, find appealing or whatever just you know a little observation like that just like took off so uh yeah, yeah. i remember <laughs> at the start of the pandemic a lot of people were at the start of the pandemic a lot of people were tweeting the coronavirus equal equals carnivorous exactly. and there's a there was a, in fact a brilliant there was a headline which i can't remember now uh that had to do with uh anyway there was a headline that came out in perfect cryptic form I don't know if we can dredge that up in real time here, but it was, there will never be a natural, unintentional, cryptic form headline as good as that one. It was, uh, we'll, we'll have to just tweet it sometime because I'm not going to come up with it, but. Um, um, oh, uh, I, I, sorry, I, I just, I just found the, the headline just, to, oh, I just it. went for it. So yeah, so it was uh, PETA, you know, the animal rights folks had a headline on their website, which was, um, coronavirus outbreak is linked to eating animal flesh. Um, and Eric Berlin, <laughs> no, <laughs> regardless of the factual content of that headline, um, Eric Berlin, the great puzzle master noted that that headline works per perfectly as a cryptic crossword clue, um, where, uh, you know, you could, you could have an anagram indicator there of outbreak, I guess, and then eating animal, f uh, links to eating animal flesh, whatever is your definition. Um, yeah. And so that was from. That was from that was actually January 2020. That was even like before it, it became like a pandemic thing. when we were yeah. we were first learning what coronavirus was. And and I guess that explains why there was this kind of alarmist headline because we didn't even know what it was about. But um, as early yeah. as that, you know, people were, so for people that aren't as familiar with cryptic clues, current so coronavirus outbreak in a cryptic clue, there might be a word that signifies that you might need to anagram or rearrange the letters of something that it refers to. So coronavirus outbreak might be an indicator of, oh, this is gonna be an anagram of coronavirus. And then the second part of a cryptic clue is always a literal definition. Um, and in that case is linked to eating animals, uh, something, whatever exactly yeah. words were, um, you know, is, is close to a definition of carnivorous uh, as you're gonna get. And so, you know, right there, we just, you know, we just uh, bow in appreciation that it happened. But but to reiterate, it's not true. There's no misinformation right. on this podcast. Yes, <laughs> right. Misinformation on a podcast is not where you want. That's not a zone, a lane you want to be in these days. <laughs> get, yeah, flag. Yeah. But and and there's there's another good. Um. So so not only is coronavirus 
an anagram of carnivorous. It's all it's also a consonancy of carnivorous. C R N V R S. The consonant string in there uh, maintains. There is another word related to the pandemic, which is contagion, which has a, a, a phrase, a phrasal anagram. I can't go on, and that is also a consonancy of. Um, th those are consonancies of each other. C N T G N uh, maintains. And so there's some wordplay. There's, you know, there's lots of good pandemic wordplay. We did a little, I mean, we weren't the only ones to notice, but we did some kind of tweet on um, Dem in a panic is, you know, so Dem being a democratic, it's a kind of a slang shortening for a democratic politician, the, the Dems and the Repubs. Um, so, you know, uh, coronavirus has Dem in a panic, or you might maybe to make it a cryptic clue, you might name a democratic politician here like Nancy Pelosi. So, you know, Coronavirus has Nancy Pelosi in a panic would be a cryptic clue for pandemic. So early on, we were um, not happy to have a pandemic, but we did what we could to make some wordplay out of it, published some things <laughs> yeah. about it on Beyond Wordplay. Uh, what else are you going to do in, in the lockdown? Well, then we did a well, whole riff on consonancies. <laughs> yeah, so so you asked about and what goes on inside NPL. Consonancies are one type of wordplay. Um, we, we riffed on that uh, pretty well. People can go to beyondwordplay.com and they'll see um, kind of a history of, well, they'll see the latest post, but they can also access other articles we've published in the last year and a half or so. Um, we mentioned letter banks. I wanted to kind of, th that's a that's a particular type of flat or wordplay type within the NPL, as, as Ben mentioned, Will Shorts invented it a while back. Um, I had fun for a while, and, and this I think speaks to our approach. Um, using uh, sort of databases and computer searches combined with kind of a hand grown, you know, hands made, whatever aesthetic approach to find things that kind of sat between the computer searchable and the handmade. And so for a while I was finding 13 letter isograms. So things that use half the alphabet without repeating and, um, you know, that, that make longer, that, that form the letter banks of longer words and phrases and then making flats with those so if I can, I don't have these at the ready, but um, uh, oh, the best one, of course, the longest word, the longest common dictionary word you can make without repeating. Well, there's two of them, actually. So dermatoglyphics, dermato being uh, skin and glyph, you know, glyphic being print. It's a word for fingerprints. And so it turns out you can make Metallica discography out of that if you really torture it. And there's other things like that. So some of them I found by computer search and some of them I kind of just stumbled into and I was writing flats for a while that um, picked those up. And we did do a letter bank post at the beginning of last year, which tried to pick some, you know, some good examples of that. But the thing I wanted to mention there was, and this goes back to um, why we named the whole thing Beyond Wordplay. So I think there's an intersection between the dictionary and the pop culture references that is very much at the heart of what we wanted to you know, kind of foster and put together. The the father of recreational linguistics is generally acknowledged to be a guy named Dmitry Borgman. He was a bit of a character and, you know, without getting into his, you know, whole personal aspect, he was a bit obsessive and he wrote two books in the mid to late 60s. Ben can correct me if I get my dates off. Um, one of them was called Language on Vacation and one of them was called Beyond Wordplay. And these are like the kind of books Beyond that, Language. Sorry, Beyond, beyond language. language. Oh, I screwed up the whole entry here. Beyond Language. So I guess first there was Language, and then there was Beyond Language. Um, and these are the kind of books that, you know, we used to go to the library and take out, and they had like the plastic. I still have, you can't see on a podcast, but I've got a couple copies of things here. You know, they've they still got the plastic covers on them. They still smell like the mid-60s, and they've got that very analog, hands-on feel to them. These are the collections of, of his obsessions with anagrams and, you know, all the different types of uh, wordplay we're talking about. I don't know if he, he must have nailed the letter bank in some form, but, um, you know, he wrote about pyramid words where they had the pattern of one letter once, you know, the, uh, one, two, three, four, like pepper tree has one uh, T, two R's, three P's, four E's, things like that. He, he kind of covered all of it, mixed in with people, places, things, and also his own fanciful, maniacal brain creations that were just these creative extensions of all that stuff. We very much wanted to capture that. And then the question is, well, as databases have become more available, how much can you get, you know, 
kind of you have tools to search all that. And we are creating a tool called Ask Dimitri internally, which enables that, you know, which has people, places and things. And, you know, we haven't released to the public yet, but we will. Um, so you can use it to do things like, um, you know, what are all the interesting I call them popular items, people, places, things, phrases that you can find with a particular letter bank. So I'm sitting here. I had written a a flat for the Enigma, the publication of the National Puzzlers League, based on the letter bank upholstering. So upholstering has, I think, 12 different letters, no repeats. And I remembered discovering, because it wasn't in any database, that you could make sleeps through the night. So I did a, a flat on upholstering and sleeps through the night. And just sitting here, I said, what if we put this into Ask Dimitri? I wonder if it's going to find anything. And I said, I, I bet it's not going to because, like, you know, what else could there be in there? Lo and behold, loosen the purse strings. Nice. So, you know, <laughs> it's like there's just more to discover. And there's something about it that one second we all had where we're like, oh, there's something very elegant about the fact that it was sitting there to be discovered, and that's endless. You know, there's just more and more and more to be discovered. We'll keep getting more into databases, and yet there'll be more that isn't quite captured, and that's the beauty of it. You know, that's, for me anyway, that's... Yeah. There's so many different constraints there to be found. Yeah. I, I remember about 10 years ago, 13 years ago to be exact, I started writing palindromes by taking pairs of letters. Instead You're the only one, man. I, I, I was sure that that seemed so obvious. Somebody must have done it before. Apparently not, which is quite, that's quite amazing. So that's led me down the path of just trying to find out new things that perhaps don't exist. I recently came up with a, a variant on the charade or, or redivider where you switch every pair of letters. So for mm -hmm. example, item becomes time because the I and T switch, then the E and the M switch. Unfortunately, I was quickly told that this already existed but only in Japanese. Someone in Japan had invented this before me. Beautiful. Which is very interesting considering how different that language is. Yeah, I was wondering how that would work exactly for uh, their writing system, but uh, <laughs> yeah. interesting. Yeah, um, I just wanted to mention too, because you know we're talking about Dmitry Borgman sort of being the, the father of, <laughs> the founder of this field that he called Legology. It's also been called Recreational Linguistics. So he wrote those two books in the 60s, but then he also established Wordways, the Journal of Recreational Linguistics in 1968, which for many years until recently was was a, a place to share kind of the high level technical discoveries, uh, not necessarily writing for for um, you know people who uh, just have a passing interest in in these wordplay forms, but uh, getting into the real nitty gritty of it. And um, you know. Uh, Eric and I back in the day both contributed to it. Eric Eric contributed more than I did. And so, uh, for instance, super vocalix, which came up uh, earlier, uh, those words that have A, E, I, O, U exactly once, um, that is a term that Eric uh, coined and shared in an article in the journal Wordways. Nowadays, you can find out about super vocalix if you go to beyondwordplay.com, if you go to the Facebook group, um, there's super literally vocalic. a super vocalic Facebook group, which I did not start. Yeah. OK, so that's how crazy the world is. I'm surprised <laughs> you didn't mention this again when when, when you mentioned Unoya, which is almost oh. a perfect super vocalic. It is a yeah, with only one constant. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yes. Uh, um, so it's interesting. I mean, again, yeah, for for many years, I think uh, if you happen to have a subscription to Wordways, uh, you might know about these interesting things. Um, uh, Ross Eckler, the longtime editor, along with his wife Faith Eckler, wrote a book called Making the Alphabet Dance, which kind of collected a lot of uh, the best uh, from Wordways, which was in this tradition from those Dimitri Borgman books. Chris Cole wrote his own uh, wordplay book, which um, relied on um, the Merriam-Webster Unabridged Dictionary to sort of find the the best of various uh, various examples of you know different types of uh, uh, you know, words based on their patterns and what you, you know what you could find in terms of the longest uh, examples of various things. And so that that this was this has always been a kind of a tradition, I think, since Dmitri Borgman of like trying to come up with um, kind of again these sort of technical, technically impressive discoveries. Uh, with Beyond Wordplay, I think we've been able to present that in a way that may draw more people in than than uh, previously. Who you know, people who just 
might be, you know, part of the National Puzzlers League or a Wordways subscriber or that sort of thing. I'd love to share a, a thing about Chris Cole's book and my personal experience, because this is actually how I got on this particular train. So the book that Ben mentioned is literally called Wordplay. And Chris, as I mentioned, is a guy who's got a kind of an old school technology background. Um, and what he and he was doing the project to actually digitize Merriam-Webster's content and create the first CD, uh, CD-ROM and um, the first website for Merriam-Webster that presented the uh, dic their dictionaries, which there's a lot of detail about that we don't need to get into. But point being, he had access to some of their underlying source, you know, electronic versions of some of their dictionaries. And, and he loved the recreational aspect of this. So he had one of his uh, or one or more of his developers basically write these scripts that took all these things people had been doing manually, trying to find, and I'll give you a good example of one of them, and then just blitzed them with the computer and said, all right, in the Webster's Third Dictionary, using it, now there's no word list for the Webster's Third Dictionary that's out there. Another story, there's some legend, but um, you know, as far as the public knew, there was no actual, expanding a dictionary, a set of dictionary entries into a an unambiguous word list is actually a much more challenging task than one might think because they're sort of implied forms is brain children a word you know there's a lot of like examples of we can go garden paths we can go down but he had a word list and so he ran this kind of computer script and generated i'll give you an example this is a challenge that was out there um it was fairly well known that the longest we talked about the longest one word you could make the longest word in the in the dictionary um, I put that in air quotes for those who can't see, you know, that you could make without repeating a letter was um, dermatoglyphics, also uncopyrightable. Um, there's some question about whether you could stick an S on it, make uncopyrightables. But as far as the dictionary was concerned, you couldn't. So those two sat at the top of the, the food chain there for long isograms. The question is, using two words, what? how many letters could you make without repeating a letter between the two words? And the longest pair, what I call the bisogram in my Wordways articles, um, you know, pair of words that didn't repeat a letter was known to be gunpowdery blacksmith. And so I wrote this series of articles on the gunpowdery blacksmith. I didn't find that per se, but I wondered, okay, are there other um, 20? Can you beat 20, first of all? This was in the days when the computer stuff was sort of janky, like people were sort of doing it on whatever word list they had, and there was no authoritative answer to that. So Chris, in writing wordplay, ran it on the Webster's Third. And we were all using Webster's Third as our dictionary of reference for one reason. It was the games magazine, the Will Shorts approved dictionary of reference for all the games contests. So that was kind of what we all used in the, you know, early, before the Scrabble dictionary was sort of formalized on computer. So Chris ran, this, ran these scripts and he could tell you, yep, gunpowdery blacksmith is, there is no longer pair of words. Now I personally spent, I would say at least, I'll just say 5,000, I don't know, hours, looking through, like literally writing down, you know, pulling out isograms from Webster's Third and trying to pair them up. And, you know, with without computer help, trying to find a tie or beat Gunpowdery Blacksmith, I was not able to do it. So when this book came out, I was one of the few people who was like, wait a second, I actually care about this. This is going to answer this quest conclusively. I can stop my quest for the grail. And I was sure there was nothing that beat it. And I was almost assured that there was nothing that tied it because I had I had gone through all 2,662 pages of that dictionary, pulled out the darn isograms and paired them up. There was a few little cases where I just, I didn't think I had full coverage, but I didn't think I missed any. Sure enough, there was one other pair and it was thumb screwing the only 13 letter, only three vowel, the only 13 letter isogram that only uses three vowels in Webster's third, pairs with a type of Eastern European soup called Poldavi, P-O-L-D-A-V-Y, to form another two by 20 pair. And I just said, all right, I had to I had to sort of tip my hat and say, they beat me, there is one, I didn't find it. And then I got in, in touch with Chris Cole and said, how did you do this? And he said, how did you find me? And it was kind of one of those things where we were <laughs> you know, two, of the, two of the few people in the world who cared about this thing. And so, um, the reason I'm telling that story is because I think there's been a path from really focusing on the dictionary before the computer searches. Everybody was obsessed with like, what's the, you know, what's the longest anagram pair in the dictionary, which there's no the dictionary there. Publishers are various dictionaries, but for a while it was known to be 
cinematographer and megachiropteran, which is a capital uh, capitalized genus of butterfly. But these things got published in Wordways. They got published sometimes in Games Magazine, the more popular ones. And then that's kind of where the the very small group of you know the word the logo file community got the you know that was the, the 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 publication of record if you will for these things if there was one and so as that word weighs it was like a mimeograph journal like you could smell your teacher mimeographing it and we loved it we loved getting it and then they never really migrated to the online world and there's other stuff we could talk about there but so when that happened we sensed kind of a gap in this publication of record for tying together the kind of technical aspects of things with the aesthetic aspects of things and and one of our goals in beyond wordplay was to be kind of a web presence that can become the kind of you know center point for the publication of these kinds of things and linking to the other great things that are happening out there you included anthony and you know pedro and christian and other people doing amazing things in their sub genres of wordplay it's amazing to think a lot of these things were done without computers. Yeah, because it, it would it would seem like a very crazy thing to do now to try and try to solve these problems without a computer. In the year 2000, I think I was still doing that. So in the <laughs> last 20 years, it has become well, that's why we're building Ask Dimitri, because, well, at least I felt like this. I was like, I'm not doing that anymore. We got to put all this stuff together and build one tool. So I'm sitting here with a tool where you can literally say, you know, A has letter bank uh, upholstering. And it'll come back with all the values of A. With, you know, you, you can have variables that it solves for. I'm teasing a fact that you know it's a system we haven't let other people use yet. <laughs> it's coming. We we put a natural language interface on it, um, so it's going to be fun when we finally do get to release it. Yeah, it's sort of the the new frontier in wordplay discovery, but it's not going to completely uh, do away with uh, the kind of wordplay discovery that can be made by hand, uh, you know, without computer aided techniques. Obviously, Anthony, the type of, um, you know, palindromic verse and other interesting kind of wordplay constraints you come up with um, involves, you know, a, a human sensibility that you wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be able to just uh, find computationally. Um, yeah, but, you know, still writing. Yeah, exactly. Day, yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, I find these days like, you know, some of the most interesting things come out of kind of combining computational methods with, um, yeah. you know, with human intervention. And that's certainly true in the crossword world. I mean, you you see some incredible uh, crossword grids these days, as, you know, young constructors in particular who are playing with the form or, or kind of like the boundaries of what's possible in a crossword grid. Um, and uh, And a lot of that obviously requires just like having really having a really good curated word list of your own each you know the top crossword constructors all have their own word lists with um scores for you know you know what's considered good fill or bad fill um and uh having crossword software that's able to kind of churn through all the possibilities but at the same time it you know like being able to, to kind of uh harness those computational methods into something that results in some beautiful, elegant kind of yeah. wordplay is, is still kind of the sweet spot. You know, it it's really both of those things together. So whatever we're working on with uh, Beyond Wordplay, Eric's talking about this Ask Dimitri wordplay engine, it will help to uh, encourage that type of discovery, we hope, you know, in terms of, uh, exactly. you know, great wordplay finds that might be out there that, again, go beyond um, you know, dictionary word lists into pop cultural realms, whether it's song titles, movie titles, names of various people, you know, all uh, and th this whole much wider world of words that we live in um, that, you know, that we want to sort of make accessible um, through the wordplay lens. And there are endless discoveries to be found when you kind of open things up that way. And And again, this is very much like in that tradition from the 60s with Dimitri Borgman, who just like imagine I want the biggest word list possible that that contains everything that you could even conceivably consider, uh, you know, a lexical item or whatever, you know. And so we uh, we're keeping this like, you know, as broad as possible. And again, like, you know, when you do that, of course, you may be expen extending things perhaps a little too broadly for some purposes. But there are ways to kind of change your aperture, I guess, to look at, um, you know, uh, perhaps again, like if you're just focusing on 
something that we, the Eric and I care a lot about, uh, names of songs in the, that have hit the billboard charts, that sort of thing. That we is like its that. own little yeah. database yep. <laughs> um, that you can say all sorts of interesting things about. You can take that systematic approach of saying, well, what's the shortest, longest, various other, you know, things involving letter patterns um, just based on this particular set of items, the titles of songs, um, and do all sorts of fun things with. And so, yeah, yeah that's, yeah. So listen, a lot of the palindromists I know, a surprising number of them are programmers because mm -hmm. and they're not using programs to make the palindromes, but they are generating these word lists that, that are searchable. But then there's a human element still there where you have to piece it together. Yep. Well, the fun part is like, like, you know, we're all saying is, when it comes together with some other recognizable aspect of things that could have been sort of a trivia question. And I, I had a fun discovery, you know, doing exactly what Ben was saying, kind of searching through the, the, the Billboard Top 40 stuff or Hot 100 stuff. So there was a Hot 100, Sammy Davis Jr. had a song, well, a few people actually charted with a song called Earthbound, which is a nice 10 letter isogram. And it turns out that out of those letters, you can make at least two um, really nice, big top 40 hits, Turn the Beat Around, the Vicky Sue Robinson song redone by Gloria Estevan. Um, and, but you can also make Band on the Run, Paul McCartney uh, song. So, you know, when they're recognizable, you get kind of a nice little pop to it. And then I was just searching Estimetri and sure enough, um, Around the Bend came up. But it turns out that the Creedence Clearwater Revival song was not actually called Around the Bend, it was called Up Around the Bend. So it didn't come up in our searches, but I gave it another shot. And I just thought that's a nice one that eluded us the first time. And Eric, what's the one I'm kind of blanking out on? But uh, it's a letter bank involving song titles, and it was the, oh, the yeah. Raekwon song. Yeah, so <laughs> you know what I'm talking about—the Justin Bieber song and the Raekwon yeah. song. So there, there's a Justin Bieber <laughs> song called First Dance," which First is Dance. another ten-letter isogram. Doesn't repeat a letter for those who uh, aren't familiar with that term. And it can make the longest top 40 song that has another top 40 song at Hot 100, actually, as its letter bank. If you expand it and repeat the letters, you can make incarcerated Scarfaces. Um, so, so that's the yeah, Raekwon from the Wu-Tang Clan uh, mm -hmm. had had a had a song with that title. And uh, just, you know, the fact that <laughs> that it has this letter letter bank connection to this Justin Bieber song is just. Uh, yeah, we like that stuff. Yeah. Well, again, this gets it gets to the core of wordplay, which is the uncanniness of it. Yeah, I was going to mention uh, just an another example that came up in one of our recent discussions at Beyond Wordplay. Uh, Neville Fogarty uh, has joined in on uh, our little clubhouse a bit, and he's he's a great cryptic crossword constructor. He's one of the one of the constructors for the New Yorker, which has a great sort of stable of constructors now making cryptic crosswords. And in a recent cryptic crossword, it, I'll spoil it a little bit, but um, it involved an anagram that Neville found, he said, just by playing around with the letters. It, no, no, no help from uh, uh, any kind of sort of computational methods. But Robin Leach, who was the host of this show, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, back in the 80s, um, is, a, uh, is an anagram of uh, Nacho Libre, which was the... Um, you know, the Jack Black movie in, about Mexican wrestling, like Luchadors. And he just used that in, you know, as the basis for a cryptic crossword clue. But, you know, that's another example. It's just like, you know, these two items that exist in our pop culture world, Robin Leach and Nacho Libre, just happen to work. And, you know, you can create a, a fun cryptic clue out of it. And, uh, and yeah, that's, that's something that, again, Neville was able to find on his own because uh, he, he has the kind of mind that's able to see these things. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, I think that like the, this kind of the wordplay discovery uh, that, you know, we're trying to do with Beyond Wordplay will sort of feed into those fun finds. I, I mean, that kind of ties into a thing that uh, Sandy Weiss, um, the Mystery League, he, he runs, a, I think is it called mysteryleague.com? Yeah, Ben, is that the actual site so, name? Yeah. Well, he's at PZLR on Twitter, and he's a, he does a great job of making sort of, I mean, his, he's literally a professional kind of events and puzzle, puzzle maker for events, and he does a great job of making very digestible puzzles. So he's been doing on his Twitter recently these, and it, Neville's came up, but, you know, these um, self-contained uh, movie title reviews, which are in themselves cryptics. So 
Um, off the top of my head, I'm going to use another one that Neville did. I, I referred to him on it. So, um, Drunken Master, Drunken Master, watch it on Netflix, is a cryptic description of the word stream. And again, going back to how cryptics work, there's often an anagram indicator that, you know, is a word that means not quite in the right order. So in this case, drunken. If you take the letters in master, you can anagram it into a synonym of watch it on Netflix, which is, of course, stream. So, you know, you just got to you just got to clap your, you know, give give a clap to the 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 minds that notice that where it all ties together. I mean, there was one that I had never noticed. I, I kind of just tweaked it up. But um, here's a review you could potentially see, you know, in a newspaper all about Eve is top notch. Well, if you take the word all and put it around the word Eve the right way, you have the phrase a level, which is a synonym for top notch. And so, you know, that to me is like you're cooking with gas. You've got the aesthetics working. There's no seams. You know, no one can see behind the, the curtain. I, you know, even though it's just a little nugget, those little nuggets to me are what, you know, they transcend. Yeah, absolutely. That's one thing I want to go back to, because you, you both touched on this before. Dictionaries and the different editions of dictionaries and what words are allowable, which words are not. And I don't know if you've seen on, on Twitter just before Christmas, I was posting entries from a book I found called the Shropshire Word Book. Mm -hmm. And I live in Shropshire in England. And this, this is a book from the 1800s that listed words that were supposedly unique to the area. So we have things like piffering. Would you like to guess what that means? Piffering? Piffering. P I, I did see you post these, but I don't, I don't remember the meanings. But then you're so the meaning. You're to the mess meaning. around. OK. What, do, what is it? It's to mess around or waste time. To mess around. OK, yeah, that yep. that feels Sounds right for that word. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's twistified. So twistified is to be entangled. Uh, Get all twistified makes sense. Yeah. Frittening is a good one. It means a ghost. Oh. So it's obviously related to it's frightening, but it's a noun. So it's, a ghost mm -hmm. is a frittening. Anyway, there are, there are lots of them. But yeah. the, the question I wanted to ask is, so are these words or not? <laughs> if you want them to be. Um, <laughs> yes. So, so uh, so what what you're reading from is is you know the a work of of dialectology. So you know uh, this was something you said from the 19th century. So you know uh, there was a lot of effort made um, in uh, the United Kingdom um, 19th century onwards to collect you know the lexicon of various uh, various regional dialects. Um, there was a, a larger um, effort, uh, a book called the English Dialect Dictionary, and a lot of these word lists, like I'm sure the Shropshire one, fed into the EDD. Now, the OED would not necessarily include all of them. Uh, so, you know, there are plenty of sort of dialectal forms, whether it's Shropshire or somewhere else, that never entered the Oxford English Dictionary. So even though the Oxford English Dictionary is, has the largest word list and is constantly growing, that doesn't mean you will find every single dialectal form in the OED, if you're using that as your word list, in the American on the American side of things, uh, we have our own dialects, obviously, and there have been projects to collect those. So there's the uh, Dictionary of American Regional English, which is sort of the equivalent on, on the U.S. side. Um, a wonderful dictionary. I sort of served on the board of advisors for that, and um, you know uh, that will have plenty of dialectal items that uh, you will not find in you know the great unabridged dictionary from Merriam-Webster's. So um, this again is something that Dmitry Borgman wrote about in the 60s. Um, it's like, well, why not include every everything that you find in uh, dialect dictionaries or place names in gazetteers? Like, why shouldn't this all be fodder for wordplay? Um, and, um, you know, there's this idea that um, the dictionary, so-called, should be the the last say on what counts as a word, what doesn't count as a word. Um, but any lexicographer will tell you that that's, you know, kind of uh, a ridiculous kind of standard to hold. Um, J.A.H. Murray, the, the first editor of the Oxford English Dictionary, sort of um, wrote about uh, the lexicon um, as you know something that could sort of keep expanding outwards if you want to keep looking for words whether they're dialectal forms whether they're 
scientific terms, every name for a particular chemical, you know, and you know that that is its own, you know, potentially limitless direction that you can take things. Um, so you know you can keep expanding and expanding um, as much as you'd like. You can create various kinds of criteria in order to keep it from expanding too much by saying, let's say you have to find it in a particular corpus of texts. And so this is what Chris Cole was talking about uh, with that presentation Eric mentioned for Google. Google was creating its own corpus at the time based on Google Books, the you know the uh, the great uh, scanning project of uh, scanning and digitizing all of these books from research libraries. And you could say now that you have this cor mega corpus, uh, get me everything that you know has appeared at least a few times in this corpus, and that could be your cutoff. Whatever cutoff you make is going to be arbitrary, though. Um, so it's just a, like what kind of arbitrariness do you want to build into it? Um, and so, um, so you know, again, like a Shropshire dialectal word. Of course, it's a word. What's what? Why wouldn't it be a word? Just because, uh, just because it didn't uh, get into the Oxford English Dictionary, does that make it less of a word? Of course not. Um, and so, you know, that that ties into this whole idea that we've been talking about, like you know, expanding the idea of what should count. And again, like this much larger and more general idea of what counts as a word might not be, you know, the what you want if, say, you're making a making a crossword puzzle. You're, you're not necessarily going to want those structure dialectal words in your crossword puzzle. But you but might perhaps, want something like thirst trap, which Adam exactly in a puzzle. So you might. Right, you might have some uh, some more kind of you know slangy pop culture -y thing that again might not yet be in a dictionary but could be someday. Um, I, was gonna, I was just going to say actually, it seems it yeah. seems like because uh, every year more words added to the dictionary, but the dictionary seems to be quite keen on picking up new words. Well, yeah, one, I mean, one thing the Borgman project approach shifted the perspective from is something a word, is X a word, you know, given a string, you know, is it a word, to um, Give me a score and there may be multiple right. scores, but, you know, to what extent one way to score wordiness, you know, is to what extent, you know, how likely is it that a given string word, if you want to call it that, would be recognized uh, as having a meaning by uh, the average speaker, you know, the average modern speaker of a given language. And so, you know, those include things listed in physically printed dictionaries and extensions and derivations of those things and then some things not. Um, and you want to have some way of scoring those things if you want to do things like wordplay discovery for creation of puzzles. But, it, you know, you might want to push certain things that are higher interest or higher likelihood of being considered words to the top. Um, so it's not that words like frittering are not, um, or whatever those were, you know, are not words. It's just that it, it depends on the context. So you change it to a probabilistic determination and you, and you apply a context and that gives you a score that you can quote unquote objectively use to answer your question, is it a word? Yeah, and some of these kind of uh, uh, wordplay efforts that we've been talking about that, you know, come out of Dimitri Borgman and kind of the wordways crowd, um, you know, if, whether you're talking about pangrams, for instance, or these kind of, you know, Eric was just talking about isograms and isogram pairs and that sort of thing. Uh, where you may want to have again as broad a possible uh, as possible a um, a word list as, uh, that you can that you can muster. Of course, the more elegant ones will have recognizable words. But if you are, if you're again trying to sort of push the limits of what's possible, then you may want to incorporate words from all sorts of different uh, you know different sources. And in the wordways days, there was a fellow named Rex Gooch who tried to create the largest possible word list that included place names in various gazetteers and, and all the rest to, to create as big a list as possible for these types of things that you might, again, like there are all sorts of things where you're kind of really pushing the limits. So another example would be word squares. Um, and so uh, the, you know, the, the limit really for a word square where, of course, you know, words read the same across and down um, has been nine by nine. Um, a, a really kind of decent 10 by 10 word square. I, I would I would say it's not yet quite been cracked, but there have been some great kind of noble attempts in English at least. Um, apparently, um, you know, in uh, in other languages, it's it's more possible. So actually, uh, in Latin, um, there's a there's a there's a fellow who's who's been I'm going to pull up his name right now. Who's think, been? Is it Chris Long? 
Uh, no, actually, uh, more recently, Eric Tentarelli, and he actually wrote about this in WordWays, has been making um, word squares that are 10 by 10 and even 11 by 11, and I think he had his set, site set on 12 by 12. Now, he has a word list in Latin, which of course will be huge if you're able to have all of the inflected forms because you know you have your declensions for nouns and your conjugations for verbs. And uh, if you have like all the sort of record, recorded Latin forms that can generate wonderful possibilities for word squares. Um, and so again, it's like, well, you know, you can do that in Latin um, at, and like English attempts at that kind of the, the outer limits of what's possible in something like a word square will necessarily involve some things that might come from unusual sources, let's say. Uh, but uh, again, that was that that was what Dmitry Borgman had in mind when he was sort of thinking about, well, why not just sort of include everything that we possibly can? Um, and as Eric said, if you want to score it in a particular way, so so things that are sort of more recognizable rise to the top, and so you have sort of maybe higher quality stuff um, uh, at the top. But then you know you've got the sort of the vast kind of lexical resources that are out there that are available now computationally um, for you know people who want to sort of really push the limits of these things. I know you'll both be familiar with the SATA square, I'm sure. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is, there, is there a final word on a repo being a real word? Or <laughs> well, not? that's that's Mark Saltbite's territory. I know you had him on last year and, and I think you guys talked about that, but he's really good, been doing some serious research lately on the, the Sator Square. And uh, yeah, Arepo, as far as I know, just from hearing Mark Saltbite talk about these things, it's still an open question of whether that was just kind of uh, maybe created for the for that palindromic word square. Yeah, it uh, seems so. Yeah, and so even, even back then, even back in the day, people were like, well, let's, make this a word like a repo is it a word well it's a word now uh well, I, I, I would say it's not to lose yeah that is it's important not to lose sight of uh kind of to bury the lead here which is who's gonna care so um you know there are very few people around who could actually say like wait that latin form that he used was never even really that common you know it, it's a it's a matter of the kind of the cultural audience or the popular audience or the context so on the one extreme, there are mathematical exercises and things like finding word squares where you want to use as, you know, if you can't find anything else, can we find something extending the boundaries, you know, including regional dictionaries, including historical forms, things like that. But really to find a more broad audience for this stuff, and we again want to be the, the, the bridge, the arc, the, you know, to sort of tie it all together. Um, you know, you're, you're not going to have a very broad audience for that, which is not to say don't do it, it's just to say, the really, you know, the fun wordplay comes from the things that people recognize, you know, the examples of the top 40 songs we gave or, you know, we have our 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 National Hockey League thing, you know, which was like a kind of just a little thing. Um, I think I discovered it. I mean, I published it. I think I don't I haven't seen it before, but, you know, just an example of like a little piece of wordplay that's sitting in something that uh, people, you know, at least over here, we're looking at on a daily basis and may not have noticed. And we just like kind of pulled it out. Oh, I didn't even say what it was. You, like, Eric, you should explain what you're talking okay, about. Okay, <laughs> sorry. So I, I, uh, yeah, I just went right into it. I was just using this as an example of like the opposite end of the spectrum where it's like a small piece of wordplay using things people see every day versus these giant word lists that extend the bounds of what's considered a word. Um, okay, so I just was looking. Okay. I made a flat for the Enigma. That and, and a flat is a little. The Enigma verse. is the publication of the National Puzzlers League. Yes, thank you, Ben. The the a, a verse based wordplay form, and it just said, um, and I'll explain all these things. Um, you know, my favorite Northeast NHL team is the first. It it would drive me to second if you say that they're the worst. Okay, two lines. Now you have to replace first and second with the answers. NHL is the National Hockey League. Um, so the type of flat here is what's called a beheadment, which means that um, the second word is the first word with the first letter chopped off. OK, so the solution to that, uh, the first word is probably going to be a National Hockey League team. And the second word is going to be, you know, fit in the verse with the first letter chopped off. Well. The kicker here was this is what we call a quadruply overloaded flat, meaning 
the same wordplay not just works for one answer and not just for two answers, but it works for four answers. So um, I was just looking down the you know standings of the NHL one day, and I guess we can spoil the answers, right, Ben? Or should we like let sure. people? No, no one says. I go for it. It's two hours into the podcast. We'll give them the answer. Um, so <laughs> I guess the first one would be my home team when I was in New York was the Rangers. So you know my favorite Northeast NHL team is the Rangers. And the way that it was written, it was clear that the S wasn't part of the solution. It, um, it would drive me to anger if you said that they're the worst. Okay, so that's one solution. Well, the other New York hockey team is called the Islanders. You know my favorite Northeast NHL team is the Islanders. It would drive me to slander if you say that they're the worst. And if you keep going down the standings, you get uh, Bruins and Ruin, and you get, uh, help me out. Uh, there was another good one here, Ben. Help me out. Um, uh, you get Rangers you... and Anger, Bruins and Ruin. It would drive oh, me devils to and, Devils oh, and Evil. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My favorite Northeast hockey team, because the New Jersey hockey team is the devil or, you know. So it would drive me to evil if you say that they're the worst. So not only are those four hockey teams there, but they hide anger, slander, ruin, and evil. So, you know, I could pick an example that I made like that or a hundred examples that other amazing people in the NPL or others are making out there. To us, that's kind of what pulls it together. Both what we were talking about before, this like expanded word list computer search kind of thing, and the like, can you notice something in the cultural landscape that's just digestible and fun? The, th the things we do. Did I just plug my, <laughs> I, I think I did a little. I, I wanna plug somebody no. else before we're done there, before we're done here, because yeah, I, I consider myself like hanging in this community and I love like creating these things, but just as much personally, I love like bringing the attention to somebody who's just like elevating the game, you know, in, in some area. And I consider you in that, you know, in that uh, department, Anthony. But um, one of the, I would say the most rewarding experience I've personally had as part of the, um, well, other than getting to work with Ben, who I tremendously respect, um, is in terms of the public uh, kind of reaction or the reaction we've been able to get has been in the area of what we call Scrabblegrams. So um, back in the, I want to say 80s, but I actually, wait, I think it was the 90s, Games Magazine ran a contest um, to say, uh, come up with a uh, something interesting, whether it's a little story or a piece of, uh, you know, prose or poetry or whatever you can come up with using the exactly the hundred letters of the Scrabble set, including two tiles as blanks that you could use as any uh, letters. And um, there were some great responses. Um, I'll plug my brother, why not? He had a good one, which came in, which was one of the runner ups, uh, honorable mentions, which was, uh, Boulevard Diner, 1140. It's too quiet. As a gun barrel whacks my noggin, I realize Dixie set me up. So if you know, you know, if you've watched any film noir, you realize that's a really nice little sort of, you know, everything holds together. Anthony, you can appreciate the aspect of like, you know, maximizing the topicality, hiding the seams and that kind of stuff. Yeah. But but the the the, the entry that won, and I still remember this, whether it's 30 years later, I don't I can't remember exactly when it ran, was um no one had done this up to this point. So we're going to get into this seeming pedestrian like by now, but this was the first one that did it. Um, the winner was a, by a guy named David Cohen uh, from, I think, Atlanta, Georgia. And the winner was uh, a clown arcs above a trapeze. Sorry, a clown, a clown jumps, jumps above, above a, trapeze. a trapeze, arcs over 180 degrees, out in midair, quite unaware of his exiting billfold and keys. It was out That's, into midair. Is to, in, to, did I skip? Did I lose one? You just lost uh, uh, the into there. But yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's beautiful. Do you know that off the top uh, of your head? Do, I, I, I have mean, it in front of me. I just wanted oh. to fact check you in case. No, uh, no, no. You know. I was going to say I'm amazed. That I didn't know that you you were as obsessed with these as I was. No. <laughs> but, um, well, the fact that you you still remember it all these years uh, later from memory, um, you know, these things can have oh, a big effect on us. Yeah. So yeah, that put. So you wrote that up uh, for a Beyond Wordplay uh, post. So you can find that uh, from July 2020, um, where Eric was sort of giving the whole history of Scrabblegrams, including that crowning achievement by David Cohen. And then that led to 
More from David Cohen, right? <laughs> David Cohen. I, he hadn't done any of this for 20 years, right? And he doesn't do anything else in the wordplay world. It's not like we knew him or anything. We just gave him a shout out from 25 years ago. I, I don't remember. I can't remember the date that the first contest ran. But does, does he play Scrabble? Does he play Scrabble? Or no, just... he's a, he's like a he's a some form of medical dude um, that just did this. I mean, that skill would have literally nothing to do with actually playing Scrabble. You know, it would, it, I mean, playing Scrabble at a top level has much more to do with, like, being a great chess player, you know. That was just pure wordplay aesthetics. So he actually um, wrote back to us, you know, got in touch with us, said, oh, my gosh, I'm so appreciative of you acknowledging what I did. It was such a fun thing to do. And here's a bunch more I've been working on. And each one that he came back with was upping the game much as i consider anthony when i see your you know pull a ball up put a bat up you know things like that little things he was i consider you'd be upping the game with everything you publish and it was the same thing with david cohen and scrabble Grants. he was sending and i got in sort of a personal correspondence with him about this he was sending things that just kept upping the game to where i couldn't even keep up with it anymore and at one point he sent me you know an email that i that would take me a little while to dredge up here that I didn't notice. I responded in kind, but it was a Scrabble gram. And then he said, I feel I have achieved the pinnacle of what I set out to achieve. I got an email by you. And I sent him back one saying, oh, you know, whatever it was, just acknowledging how, you know, like I didn't see it. And it was, I just appreciated what he had done. But mine was a Scrabble gram too. So I was just trying to keep up. And like, I think I made it past him for 10 minutes. And then he went, wait, that's a Scrabble gram. So we wound up publishing his updated things. And people can go to beyondwordplay.com and look and look for the Scrabblegrams article. Um, he made a whole Zen koan, which is so, you know what? I should probably have it at the ready here. I, I know can we can't sit pull here it up. You want to work? I can pull it up. I have it in front of me. I had it the at the ready, except then I pulled up the Welsh. Thing. <laughs> uh, I'll, why don't I just read it out then? Sure. Okay. Sure. So uh, the title, I guess, is part of the Scrabblegram for this one, right? So the title is A Quiet, Conscious, Empty Mind. Oh, yeah. The average the average fool arrives here blind, an ego waking up to find. Oh, I'm sorry. The, yeah. So the title the title just case, repeats one of the lines. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. So the Scrabble Grand proper begins. The average fool arrives here blind, an ego waking up to find a quiet, conscious, empty mind. Now today I realize, relax, just be. And uh, so <laughs> that uh, yeah the the the. Uh, the Zen nature of that, yeah, I figured you could appreciate. Again, again well. it's so beautiful because it works. It doesn't have to be a Scrabblegram to work. And then you, you know, if you just gave that to someone, um, they would. And then he was also making poem. like dub, double haikus, like two two haikus together that formed Scrabblegrams. I mean, he, again, he was just playing with all these different constraints upon constraints, and uh, and just doing amazing work with it. And uh, again, just given a hundred. 100 tiles yeah. of course there are two blanks that gives you a little leeway because you have two blank tiles which um for the purposes of a scrabble gram can be any letter that you want to want them to be but uh even with that sort of uh that bit of leeway it's still an incredibly constrained form uh to do well and to sort of like you know come up with something poetic like like he does yeah. um it's just yes yeah, so and i know anthony's to, tried anthony's come up with his i've yeah. seen at least one on oh his. i've done one here Mine's about Scrabble. That's, I, it had to be about yeah. Scrabble. That was my extra constraint. Well, I would throw this out as something that can be attempted by at least a slightly broader audience than just yeah. the most hardcore. You know, you're not going to get the Wordle crowd doing this, but, uh, you know, anyone who's made it this far in the podcast is a candidate for, you know, think of a topic, think of your favorite movie, sit down, take the set out, make sure you have the 100 tiles there because the worst thing is you get to the end and you had 99, which has happened to me. And I was like so proud and I was like, oh, okay, well. But, um, you know, so, you know, just make a movie review of, of a movie or something or, you know, a, a current event, you know, a news news headline. Um, you can go to DaveScrabbleGrams.com. He's got, he made a deck of cards of 52 Scrabblegrams that are, you know, just unbelievable. You can order it as a gift for your, you know. Yeah, I think a lot of people could try this because, yeah, because a hundred letters is quite a lot. That's that gives you a lot of room to work with. Yeah, I mean, we, I, you know, it, it, this is too good. He he wrote a well, okay. So this is Hamlet's soliloquy: "To be or not, valid question. Life drags on, an agonizing dream, rarely a joy, but suicide." What comes next if I never wake up? Help. And that's great because there aren't any wasted words in there. There aren't any 
strange random words that don't belong. And that comes up in your work so much, which is it's even harder with palindromes. I mean, you have to be working from a big source list, you know, of things it's, to put together. It's what makes a good palindrome, really. If, there, if there's one thing that makes a good palindrome, it's it's that don't have any words that don't belong there. Yeah, and I think I, I didn't see I mean, I consider you to have revitalized that form because I just didn't see people, anybody pushing it, you know, as far as you push. I don't think anybody would have thought it would have been possible to push it as far as when I say push it, I, I mean to extend the aesthetics as far as you have while still maintaining, you know, the topicality, you know, to be able to get so many topical reference. You know, people talk about how many themers are in you know, a crossword and, you know, there's crosswords going out now that, have, you know, lots and lots of themers and the density of themers. It's in a way that's what you're doing is, you know, packing the topical reference in while not losing the aesthetics, which we salute. Oh, Vicky. Thank you. But I, I feel now I have to point out that if you look at the semis every year and other areas that there, there are, are lots of other people yes. doing yeah. some wonderful yes. work. Yes. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, Beyond Wordplay actually, uh, uh, published the news, publicized the the winners of the uh, the simis last year for 2021. Uh, we hope to do the same this year. I uh, Mark Southfight has, has uh, sent all of the uh, the nominees um, in the various categories, uh, you know, so I'm on the the judges panel again for this, as is Will Shorts. And, um, you know, Mark has gotten various folks over the years. Uh, we mentioned uh, they might be giants who had the song I Palindrome I. Well, John Flansburg is has been a judge in the past for the Simmies as uh, this is, of course, it's spelled S Y M M Y S. Um, we've also, also Weird Al Yankovic, who uh, had had a palindromic song called uh, Bob, um, was was a judge one year. Um, so this is a, a fun thing that I get to do every year to look at palindromes from Anthony and John Agee and Lori Wyke and all these great palindromists and see what you know what they've come up with in the past year. And they you know some are the the shorter ones, some are more I mean, like full poems, uh, some of them are visual. John Agee kind of specializes in ones that go along with uh, cartoon art, um, you know, combining, he wins every combining year. that. Wins that every year. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see how he does this year. He's not the only one to enter that category. Um, but it's always great to see, you know, uh, what the hardcore palindromists are coming up with every year. Um, because you would think, oh, you know, all the good ones have been found, right? I mean, like, how much can you really do with palindromes? So I'm always amazed that every year there are new ones like, oh, nobody nobody found that one. And that's actually one of the requirements for the simis is that it can't have been used before. And, you know, Mark will check to make, you know, all of his resources to make sure that, uh, but the, that these are brand new. And so it's, uh, it's a vital, a vital form that continues to like reward creativity from Anthony and, you know, all your fellow palindromists. And there's other ways to, there, there, I like the little, in, there's interesting ways to kind of pull aesthetics out of these palindromes, like the fragments that are kind of self-repeating, like order red roses, you know, it's sort of like a, did I get all that, Anthony? It's a order red rose, you can repeat yeah. it, order red roses, yeah. order red roses, or there's a seesaw one that you, that kind of self, that forms a self-repeating thing. Was it, is it, was it a seesaw I saw? I can't remember. Oh boy. I've got so many. It, anyway, there, there, well, there's. Was it a cat I saw? Was it a rat I saw? No, there it was. <laughs> it was. It was something with the seesaw. Wait, seesaw was. I don't know. Sorry, I, I didn't have that it's, at the red. What's interesting is that you do because you get these small self-contained bits of palindrome that you can work into yeah. bigger things, and then sometimes you can get a string that cannot be divided at all, and it's it's an interesting challenge to try to write a palindrome that at no point could it be split into two palindromes that are, are just sewn together. Right. Uh, okay, we've been talking for over two hours, but I don't want to miss anything out. So is, is there anything else that you want to say about Beyond Wordplay? Well, uh, check out beyondwordplay.com. There's a link at the top also for our newsletter, which we mentioned, uh, which uh, lately we've been putting out quarterly, um, where where uh, we try to sort of round up uh, what's happening. And there's, there's a lot of overlap, obviously, with the crossword world, but we really do try to branch out uh, beyond that to all sorts of creative endeavors, whether it's, you know, uh, a good Anthony Etherin palindrome or, or you know, other things that, that are out there, because we do see it as this much kind of broader, not just a community, but like, you know, overlapping communities with, with this shared interest. Um, and so, uh, you know, 
we hope and if you follow us on twitter on just at, yeah, we didn't you know, just at beyond wordplay we try to give you a steady dose of you know observations uh, original wordplay and uh, linking to other things that are going on out there and i would i would just put in a plug for if there's if there are people that are hearing this and are inspired and they feel like they have a unique take on some form of wordplay get in touch with us at what do we want us what how do we they email us ben info at beyond wordplay.com that works sure we'll yeah actually see, we'll see that <laughs> uh, you, know, uh, you can always tweet at us too. Uh, yeah. You know, we'll, we we like to engage with people on Twitter. We also uh, have a Facebook presence, which might not be quite as active as as uh, Twitter. Um, but uh, yeah, and sometimes you know there will be various little wordplay challenges um, on uh, on the Twitter account where we're we're engaging with folks, and we love to hear uh, from people that way as well. So yeah, and out. if there are if there are people that feel like they've got you know. Um, but they're budding constructors or they they've got a certain kind of puzzle type that they feel is a little unique let's you know hit us up we certainly are open to publishing puzzle content um from people who aren't otherwise heard from great well i hope this community continues to grow and i, I wish you all the best because it's exciting to see that people are getting more involved and you know it might bring some sales for me as well if people get into there this stuff go. more so i've got my, <laughs> I've got my copy of slate <laughs> pedals here somewhere yeah, I do as well. I think I'm looking at it, but I can't. More power to Penderac Press. I, I yeah, hope yes. that uh, all this wordplay interest helps you out as well. <laughs> yeah, there's something. Something's happening. I mean, all this online, this good online buzz, and all the talent out there, you know, has to kind of aggregate at some point. So we feel we feel like there's been this flourishing, and um, there's there's definitely opportunity for some aggregation of things. But you know, we'll all just keep plugging along. Um, connecting each other and making our own original stuff and connecting to other people that do. 